A few uh, years ago, about 50 years ago, the great scientist uh, Einstein had given up on his work on physics and relativity and started writing books exactly about the issues we're talking about today, uh, global peace. And Einstein used to publish a book every year, and he used to come round Britain and advertise his book at regular uh, book events. And he would go from town to town and city to city. All he did with a chauffeur, a driver, he drove from one place to the other uh, to put forward his views based on his book on global peace, the subject that we're talking about today. So every night he would go from one city to another city to a town to a town, and he got through hundreds of meetings in the course of these book tours that he was doing. And he was an old man, Einstein, and one night the person who was with him, his, his chauffeur, the driver, said to him, Mr. Einstein, you look incredibly tired this evening. You know, you've given the same speech on a hundred different occasions, and I now know it off by heart. Why don't you sit in the audience as I normally do, and I will stand on the rostrum, and people will be no wiser. They don't know what we all look like, and I can give the speech. Uh, and Einstein, tired that night, agreed to do so. So the chauffeur was up on the stage giving the speech from here, Einstein sitting in the audience. And the speech went brilliantly because he had heard it so many times. And as the applause died down from the speech, and he was about to leave the stage to go to his next visit, the next meeting, the chairman for the night unfortunately said, are there any questions? So here was the chauffeur up on the stage. First question, a science question. What is the relationship, Mr. Einstein, between your theory of relativity and quantum mechanics? And the chauffeur is stumped, standing there on the platform, looking for inspiration, and then he hits on it. He said, ladies and gentlemen, this question is so simple and so straightforward. I'm going to ask my chauffeur to come up from the audience <laughs> and answer the question. Now, I uh, am not going to give the speech that Einstein uh, gave a hundred uh, times, but I'm going to talk about global peace, and I'm conscious that I'm doing it in a great uh, cathedral. Some of you may know that my father was a, a Presbyterian minister of the Church of Scotland, and I was brought up uh, in that uh, uh, re religion, and I'm a member of the Church of uh, Scotland. And my father used to tell me, you've got to be very careful when you're speaking in a church there are people of all the different political views, and therefore you've got to take into account that you can't make heavily politicized speeches uh, when you're in a church uh, with so many divergent views that will be expressed in your doing. But he told me that one of his friends who was a minister had a secret way of indicating what his political views were. So if on the Sunday after the elections, his own party had won, he would choose the first hymn for the church, Now Thank We All Our God. If the opposition won, he would choose a different hymn, Dear Lord and Father of Mankind, Forgive Our Foolish Ways. <laughs> and if someone else won, a third party, uh, Simon, you might be interested in this, <laughs> Oh God Works in Mysterious Ways, is wonders <laughs> to perform. So I'm going to talk about peace and about reconciliation uh, and do so in a way that I hope can command support for the proposals I'm going to make across uh, the wider community. But I do not forget that Coventry has sent a message to the world over these last 75 years. Coventry, one of the great industrial cities of our country, the center of some of the greatest efforts we had to make during the First and Second World War with the great engineering skills that this city has. And then on 14th November 1940 to be devastated uh, by the first and most uh, horrend horrendous kind of bombing that was systematic. 500 planes, 500 tons of explosives descending on Coventry two-thirds of houses damaged, a third of the businesses damaged and put out of productions in many cases, more than 500 people uh, dead. Coventry devastated by this, but this was only the 18th, as I understand it, bombing that had taken place. It was the worst. And it reminds us that while in the wars of previous centuries, it was the military that were the greatest casualties, 
In the wars of the 20th century, it is civilians, including children, who have become terrible casualties of war. As combats have tried uh, to use the pressure on civilian populations to try to win their military uh, campaigns. And so, if the world wants to understand what war can do and the damage it can do to civilians and to children, then they need look no further than what has happened and what happened to Coventry. But if the world wants to understand what reconciliation means and what the resilience of a people can do and what reconciliation can bring in terms of sending a message of peace throughout the world, then they too should come to Coventry and see what you have achieved. And this cathedral itself, rebuilt after the Second World War, with such care and attention, reminding people of the past but building into the future, is a symbol of that reconciliation and peace. And after the Second World War, as you know, as a result of what happened, and then of the Holocaust that had hit one group of people around the world, the Jewish population, we had the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. We had the demand that we entrench in the governments of the world that peace and security would never give way again to war and to destruction. And then we had a series of organizations from the United Nations to NATO to others that were to build the peace. And I ask you then how much we have learned, because when we look forward, think of 1995 in Rwanda. More than 50 years after the end of the Second World War, less, just less than 50 years after the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was giving people the right against war crimes and genocide and against the destruction that conflict can bring. Five years after the Convention of the Rights of the Child. Let me tell you a story. If you go to Rwanda and you go to the capital and you go to what is the museum of the genocide in Rwanda and you go into this uh, building and then go up one floor of stairs one stairs to the, to the second floor, you will find what is called the Children's Museum. And then if you look round this Children's Museum, you will see photographs of young children, Rwanda's own children. And you'll come to one of them, which struck me and which I don't think when you hear this story, it can ever leave you. And it's a photograph of a young boy, and his name is David. And there are a number, a small number of key facts about this young life. The photograph, and then it says name, David. Age, 12. Ambition, to be a doctor. Favorite sport, football. Favorite hobby, making people laugh. And then it says, Death by mutilation. Last words, the United Nations is coming to help us. And that young boy, in his innocence and in his idealism, believed that when we had made a promise that we would not allow people to become victims of genocides and of war crimes, we would honor it. He genuinely believed till his last breath that the United Nations and the people of the world was coming to help the children of his country. And these last words which were spoken to his mother who was also mutilated in these terrible crimes were an expression of his hope, his desire that we had learned the lessons of the Second World War and that we would never allow children, young people, anybody to be victims of genocide again without trying to act on their behalf. And yet in Rwanda, in these few months in 1990s, in the middle of the 1990s, 800,000 people died. 300,000 of them were children. And what a tragedy that 50 years almost after the Second World War, we had not learned enough of the lessons of the damage and destruction and the need to act when people's lives are at risk because of war crimes and genocide and it failed to act.
That was 20 years ago. And cast forward your mind to where we are now in 2015. It's almost incredible to say this, but there are 40 wars happening in different parts of the world today. Before the end of the Cold War, there was about 50 wars ongoing, and people thought that when the Cold War ended and all these pressures of a conflict between two different parts of the world, then the numbers of wars between different nations and within different nations would cease. And for a time, yes, the numbers fell, and now they're up again. So what is the result of this, and what are we now having to deal with? Today, 60 million people are displaced from their homes as a result of conflicts. 60 million, that's the whole of the population of the United Kingdom, displaced from their homes because they are the victims of someone taking arms against someone else. And 30 million of these are children. So there are 30 million children who are displaced from their homes, their schools, their communities, their chance of preparing for the future. And it is a horror that we've got to address here and now because of what is happening. And 20 million of these people are not displaced within their own countries. They are refugees in other countries. And the reason that there is pressure within Europe is because there are 10 million refugee children, 20 million refugee adults, who are having to seek a new life as a result of being pushed out of their countries because of conflict. And if you just take one example today, because we talk about hundreds of refugees coming to the United Kingdom, let me tell you this, there are four million people who are refugees from Syria already today. The figure will probably be five million as a result of this civil war within the next few months. And two million of these young people are children. And these are children who have been denied the chance of being not only just in their homes, but in their home country, who are denied food and shelter, who are in the worst possible position for getting health care, and many of them are in tents and huts and shelters, and in some cases camps, and they are not getting uh, what I'm going to say something about in a minute, their basic right to education as well as to health care. And this is one of the terrible effects of war that is affecting so many people today. And we cannot either be complacent about this or recognize that by helping one or two people, we are going to deal with this problem. We have got to help the millions of people who are in difficulty. And I'm pleased that Coventry has been one of the few cities in the United Kingdom where because of your history of peace and reconciliation, and your attention to the problems of refugees and displaced people, you have been taking refugees uh, from the region for the last two years. But you know, it's not just that people are displaced as a result of war and that people are refugees as a result of war. The first case that became before the new International Criminal Court was a case in the DRC, the Democratic Republic of Congo, and that civil war that has been taking place between the different factions within that country. And the case was of a rebel leader who had been militarizing children, using children as weapons of war, children being used in conflict, children being used as battering rams by adults so that they could have a better chance of winning that conflict. And that first case that came before the International Criminal Court was about the violation of children's rights. Thousands of children have been forced by one warlord into being militarized and becoming part of child militias. And you know the most recent case before the International Criminal Court, again DRC, is a case that is being brought not just about using children as child soldiers, but using girls as sex slaves in a war that is taking place in that country. And so the rights of children are not just being violated in war by them being displaced and denied their basic rights to education and health. The rights of children are being violated by them being used as military weapons and them being used in some cases as sex slaves. And anybody who has read about what is happening in Iraq, 
in the different ethnic conflicts that are taking place in that country now will know also the horrible atrocities that are being practiced against girls forced into marriage, uh, some of them trafficked as sex uh, slaves, uh, and their future uh, put at risk in every case as a result uh, of war. And we should remember, too, that schools are being used as weapons of war in many countries now today. We used to think that hospitals and religious establishments and schools were regarded as out of bounds, and certainly the international law says that they are. But increasingly we are finding, in particular, that schools are being used by rebel factions and different organizations fighting their wars, and they become military establishments rather than what they should be, sanctuaries and havens of safety for young, innocent children in war. And I'm concentrating today in my remarks on the impact of conflict on children and young people. Because children and young people are the innocent victims of war. They cannot be expected to have made a judgment about one side or another side. They should not be expected to be drawn into conflicts. They should, under international law, be properly protected, as the statutes of the International Criminal Court says they should be. But of course, that is not the case. And let me just say one thing also about the denial of rights to children. This afternoon, I understand you will hear from some great people who have been working in South Sudan, in that country which has been undergoing a succession of civil wars, including the secession of that country from Sudan over these last few years. And I went to uh, Juba, the capital of South Sudan, and to the countryside in South Sudan to look at what could be done to help the children that had been victims of war and to help them out of that situation. And you know, I met a group of mothers that were brought together in this village outside Juba. And they were teenagers who had become mothers. Most of them had become pregnant at the age of 12, 13, 14, or 15. And I was asking them about what they needed and what was their uppermost priority. And all of them said the same thing. Yes, they were refugees from the north to the south. Yes, they needed better accommodation and shelter. Yes, they wanted better provision of food and health care. But what they wanted most of all was that the children should have the chance to get an education. And in this conflict and civil war hit South Sudan, people are desperately trying, and I think you'll hear from them today, charities, the churches, voluntary organizations to provide help for these children. But I went to the village school, and the village school was one hut, prefabricated. It was provided by a great organization from Bangladesh called Brak. It had one teacher. There were probably about 30 books in this one hut classroom. And there were about 20 children sitting on the floor. There was no desk in this prefabricated building. But the one memory I have of being in that room that one prefabricated hut was of the portal, the small window from which you could see in and out. And as I looked out, I saw about a hundred children standing outside, looking in on an education that they couldn't have, looking in because there was only places for 20 children in that school. We had done so little to provide for the needs of these children and the hundred children outside looking in at something they couldn't have were going to continuously be denied education. Only a third of girls in South Sudan are at school. It is one of the worst places in the world for the provision of education. Only 1% of that country's national income is spent on education. And I went to see a mother who was herself uh, very sick. And she told me that she had had to make a choice. She had eight-year-old twins, and only one of them could go to school because there were not places for two of them. And she had to choose between which of her twin sons was going to get the benefit of education. And then go to Nigeria, Boko Haram, that terrorist group that is practicing a civil war and whose name Boko Haram actually means in the Hansa language, Western education is sinful.
and see what they have been trying to do to prevent young children getting the chance of education during the war that is being fought in the north of Nigeria. And as you may remember, more than 200 girls were abducted and taken from their school dormitories on one terrible evening and not anything of any significance has been heard of them again. But the fear is that they have become sex slaves, that they have been forced to convert to another religion, that they will never return to their parents. And who can think of this terrible tragedy of war, that these parents wake up every morning not knowing whether their children are dead or alive, whether they've been molested or violated, what their future is likely to be. I went to a school in Abuja in Nigeria, which is the capital uh, city, and I was speaking to the children in that classroom uh, about what their future held for them. And it was an amazing event because suddenly lots of cars drove up at the school I was in. And believe it or not, Bono arrived, the pop singer, in the middle of what you may say is nowhere, the middle of a village outside Abuja, Nigeria, I addressing this classroom, Bono comes in, and he's got a television camera uh, uh, team filming him as he goes around Africa. And so you do what you always do when you're talking to children in the school. You ask what they would want to be when they grow up. And of course, some of the kids wanted to be airline pilots, some wanted to be nurses, doctors, engineers, scientists. Uh, nobody wanted to be a politician. And to Bono's surprise, nobody said they wanted to be a pop singer either. But you know what was happening there? That school was collapsing. Our aid budget was so pathetic that the corrugated iron roof was falling apart. All the kids were sitting on the floor. There was no desk for the kids. There was no computers. Uh, it looked as if water was coming in uh, the roof that was preventing them being able to use some of the classrooms. But up the road, you know, a madrasas had been created by a rich Saudi-sponsored extremist group offering free education, and the children were drifting away from our aid-sponsored school with the promise of free education to be indoctrinated into terrorist tactics by an extremist faction. So here is the world we are dealing with today. 30 million displaced children, 10 million refugees around the world, schools militarized in some of the areas of conflict, children's rights being violated systematically, basic rights promised in the UN charters, like the right to education, vital to building for the future, being denied. And what then have we got to do about this? I start from where Desmond Tutu uh, take, took you in the remarks he made. Some of you may have heard of the inauguration address that was given in the United States of America by John F. Kennedy when he became President of the United States in 1961. A famous address, one of the most memorable addresses in history. Some of these great uh, uh, famous lines, uh, ask not what your country can, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. A great statement about public service. Never negotiate from fear, but never fear to negotiate. A great statement about the importance of diplomacy, which perhaps leaders should have taken into account more over these last uh, 50 years. And then Richard Nixon, who was the defeated candidate for president, was asked, well, which of these great lines that Kennedy uttered would you like to have delivered in your presidential address if you had won in 1960? And he said there was only one. I promise I will discharge the office of President of the United States of America, which he was only allowed to give eight years later when he became President. But you know, Kennedy said that day, ask not what America can do for you, ask what we together can do for the future of mankind. And then he went on to give this address in Philadelphia, and he said America in 1776 had a declaration of independence. It is now time, he said, that we have a declaration of interdependence. And this idea that Desmond Tutu spoke so eloquently about, that we are peoples with shared needs, mutual interests, 
common obligations to each other and we are in it together and have got to make sure that we build a world where we recognize the rights of each person and their responsibilities one to another. So what should we do? First of all, it seems to me, we've got to learn the lesson of the last 50 years and that while we built the idea of reconciliation and the idea of defending people's rights, we have not and done enough to secure the detail. So I would suggest that the International Criminal Court has got to be strengthened so that people are in no doubt that if there is genocide, war crimes, if there are crimes against humanity, then they will, will be brought to justice. And in particular, where it's children and young people and where cases are not being brought when we know these violations are taking place, then let us create an international children's court so that we can deal with the violations that particularly are practiced against children. And you know, Grasha Michelle, the wife of Nelson Mandela, proposed that there had to be action taken where children's rights were violated in conflict uh, and there had to be an annual report to the Security Council of the United Nations. And instead of it being simply a children's committee, the Security Council itself had to deal with these issues. Well, for all the range of issues, not just the ones she raised when she talked about the darkest days of humanity and civil wars in Africa, but for all the abuses of children's rights that I've been talking about, there has to be an annual discussion, there has to be regular discussions by the Security Council of the United Nations about what is happening. And you know we have the Convention for the Rights of Children and we have a stipulation that any child should be able to bring an action to the international authorities that they have been denied rights in their own country and that the international law should be practiced in such a way that their rights can be upheld. And we should make sure that children are given these rights and young people given these rights to be able to bring these cases. And then we have got to make sure that in countries themselves, the rights of young people, and I'm talking here about young people, are properly recognized. There should be children's commissioners in every country to report on where there are violations, not just in one or two countries, but in countries which are most susceptible to the rule of law being abandoned. And there should be children's assemblies and parliaments, such as the youth parliaments we have here. They should be in other countries as well. And then we should make sure that there is a right to these basic services for young people. A right to health care, yes, a right to food and a right to shelter. But for a very limited sum of money, we could make every children have the basic right to education, irrespective of the borders, irrespective of where they live, irrespective of whether they are in conflict situations or whether they are at home. And so I'm proposing that we set up a humanitarian fund for education in emergencies. At the moment, if a child in Syria is denied education in Jordan, Lebanon and Turkey, it'll be because they have fallen through the net. Humanitarian aid goes to food and shelter, and development aid is long-term and cannot deal with emergencies. So we need to create a humanitarian fund for the first time, and I hope it will be done at the World Summit in Istanbul in June, the Humanitarian Summit. We need to create a fund that allows for us to make allowances uh, where there are refugee children who have been denied the chance. You see, food, shelter and health care are vital to survival. But there's one thing that they cannot give that education can give. Because if a young child is denied the chance to think or plan or prepare for the future, they will lose hope. But if a young person is given the chance to go to school and to think about careers and jobs and to be able to plan and prepare for the future, then they will have hope. And that is why it is so important that the United Nations and the various organizations make sure that young people and children in particular at primary school level have the chance to continue their education and it can be done. This week, we are talking about the problems of Syrian refugees coming to Europe, but also Syrian refugees in Jordan, Lebanon and Turkey. And I said there are two million children. Most of them are not at school. Many of them are on the streets. Some of them have been trafficked 
and there is evidence about the numbers of people traffickers who are operating in these countries and others where there is civil war. The rate of child marriage of Syrian children has doubled in the last few years, so that 26% of Syrian children are being married before they are of school leaving age. And that is one of the results, a doubling of the marriage rate because of the civil, civil war. And we have put forward a proposal that every child should have the chance of education by having double shifts in existing schools. So in Lebanon, Jordan and Turkey, the same school opens in the morning and early afternoon for the local children and in the late afternoon and early evening to provide an education for the Syrian children. It costs only $500 per child per year, $10 a week, because you're making use of existing facilities. And as a result of that, we have managed to secure 170,000 children in Lebanon are now in these double shift schools and getting an education possibly for the first time for five years of that civil war. And the rates of child marriage and the rates of trafficking and the rates of child labor, which is another huge problem, children being forced into work in the refugee uh, camps or the refugee situations in which they're in. But we need to provide a million children with education. And we can do that for only $10 a week per child. And we need to raise the money to do so. And what is tragic is that most times when there's a humanitarian emergency, there's a shortage of facilities or a shortage of people to deliver the support services that are needed. There is no shortage of schools, there is classrooms, and there is no shortage of teachers. We can get the teachers. What there is is a shortage of money, and that reflects a shortage of compassion and political will to act. So if we are serious about dealing with the effects of civil war and the effects of conflict, then we have to make provision across the board for the young people who are the most neglected and yet the most innocent victims of these uh, conflicts. Now, where does this take us? Out of this conference in these last uh, two days and in the discussions that you're having, it seems to me the first thing we've got to do is put forward a vision of a society that can be better at dealing with conflict and war and removing the threat of conflict and war than we are at the moment. Some of you may have read a famous book called Clockwork Orange, written by Anthony Burgess, whom I happened to meet before he died. And it was a famous uh, book, as you may know, because of the film that was made by Stanley Kubrick. And that film went round the world and portrayed a Britain where there was a cycle of violence involving young people that seemed to be never ending and seemed to be almost endemic to a particular generation of young people. And Clockwork Orange portrayed a violent society. And yet Anthony Burgess was a great Catholic. And you know, the book that he wrote, Clockwork Orange, had 21 chapters. But when he sold the book to America, he was so hard up, he accepted the publisher's uh, stipulation that in America they would only print chapters 1 to 20 and omit chapter 21. And when chapter 21 was omitted, then Stanley Kubrick made his film based on only chapters 1 to 20, no chapter 21. But the problem was that while chapter 1 to 20 showed this never-ending or apparently never-ending cycle of violence, chapter 21 was actually the important chapter. It was about redemption. It was about how this young man who had been in this vicious spiral of decline because of violence was himself to become a father and recognize the errors of his ways and he could not bring up his child so that that child would again be subject to the same spiral of violence that he had been through. And Anthony Burgess regretted it for the rest of his life. For the sake of a few pounds or dollars selling his book to America, he had allowed the publisher to omit the most important chapter and allowed the film Clockwork Orange to be exactly the opposite of what he had wanted to portray. That even in the worst possible situation when there was violence that seemed never ending, there was a chance of redemption and that a young person could be persuaded to change his ways. And the difference between chapters 1 and 20 
and chapters 1 to 21 is fundamental. There is one vision of the world which is Hobbesian, this never-ending cycle of violence that almost is inescapable and something we can do nothing about. And yet there's chapter 21, and the chapter that I want to talk about, and I think you all want to talk about, where you can see things being done, when you can see people doing things differently, when you can see people realizing the error, the wastefulness, the evil of conflict and war, and deciding that there would be reconciliation. You know, in Lebanon today, which is one of the most divided countries in the world, a third Christian, a third Shia, a third Sunni, governments that can't even agree that one person can be the president, because there's no president at the moment in Lebanon. But because of the Minister of Education in that country, they've agreed to have a curriculum in the schools which is about reconciliation between the religions of, these, of the country. And because children are being brought up with the same curriculum on peace studies, they are learning that it is possible to overcome the differences, particularly the differences brought about by extreme ideologies, and find a way of working together. And chapter 21 is what we should be aiming for, that we don't end the story as Burgess did for his film with chapter 20, we move on to chapter 21. And that raises the next thing that we've got to do. We've got to find a way of working together across religions and across borders. You know, when John Kennedy, I mentioned him a few minutes ago, went down to the space station, which is now called Cape Kennedy after his name, uh, named after him after his assassination. But he went down and he had said to people, we want to get a man into space before 1970. We want to get a man into space, and I'm telling you to do that now. And he went down to Cape Canaveral, which it was then, and he asked people who were all the team what they were all doing. And they came to the first person who said he was an astronaut. The second person said he was an engineer. The third person said he was one of the scientists. The fourth person said he was one of the managers. And then he came to the fifth person, who was actually one of the cleaners. And he asked her, what was she doing? And she said, I'm helping put a man on the moon. And she was absolutely right. She was part of this team that was helping the great project that had been agreed by the whole of the American people that they would conquer space and make sure that it was possible scientifically to land a person on the moon. And she felt that she was part of that endeavor, even although she was doing one of the least valued jobs in that operation and certainly one of the least well paid. And we've got to make people see that no matter what their qualifications are, no matter where they come from, no matter what their nationality, we can overcome differences and we can work together. And the final thing, and this is where I want to end, we've got to give people hope. You know, uh, Desmond Tutu is one of the great men uh, of our history. And he, alongside another great man, has probably made the greatest difference in the conquering of racial prejudice uh, that we've seen uh, in our times and indeed across history. And that is, of course, his work with Nelson Mandela. And I had the great honor of knowing Nelson Mandela well in the last years of his life. In fact, after he uh, came out of prison, became president, I happened to meet him and was able to go and visit him in South Africa and in Mozambique where he spent some of his time. And we brought him to London on many occasions. And on one occasion, his 90th birthday, he came to speak uh, in, uh, in London. And I was uh, privileged to be able to introduce him. And Nelson Mandela was trying to raise money for his foundation, the Nelson Mandela Foundation, that was building children's schools and children's hospitals. So he had written a letter, and it's a famous letter, Nelson Mandela's letter to a child. And he'd written it in his own uh, uh, writing, in his own words. And he was auctioning it uh, to raise money uh, for his charity. And all the great celebrities were there. Bill Clinton was there. All the actors, Forbes Whitaker, Oprah Winfrey, uh, all the singers like Elton John, British actresses, Emma Thompson, they're all bidding for this uh, letter. And the prices just got out of hand. And so everybody fell out after a few hundred thousand pounds, or a few hundred thousand, uh, was announced, and we, we did it that way. Until at the last uh, bids, there were only two people left. Oprah Winfrey, 
and Elton John, bidding against each other. And Oprah Winfrey bid 800,000. That's how we were doing it, 800,000, 850,000. Elton John went to 900,000, then 950, a million Oprah Winfrey, 1.1 million Elton John, 1.2 million Oprah Winfrey, and Elton John pulled out, and then Oprah Winfrey was told she was paying in pounds and not dollars, as she had thought. So it was 1.6 million by the time she had actually paid the bill. And then we went up to the concert, and there were all the pop singers uh, there, all the celebrities, and I was sitting next to Mandela, and I had to explain to them who they were, which is something I was uniquely disqualified and unqualified for doing. The late, great Amy Winehouse, what a sadness that she wasn't there. Mandela was very interested in how she sang and what she said. And we went down to see the performance after the, um, they'd sung, and Amy Winehouse comes up to Nelson Mandela and she said, Mr. Mandela, she said, you and my husband have a great deal in common. And Mandela stumped. He doesn't quite know what it is. Yes, she said, both of you have spent a great deal of time in prison. <laughs> and you know, Nelson Mandela told me this thing that night. When he was in prison in Robben Island, and they didn't have possessions of any great number that they could have in that prison, the Bible, the works of Shakespeare was a common uh, book that they didn't have as individuals, but was shared between all the prisoners. But he was allowed one facsimile photograph uh, in his uh, prison cell. And he had the photo photograph or facsimile of a famous painting that you can see in the Victorian Albert, or you can see uh, uh, in, in exhibitions when it's shown around the country. And it's a famous painting that is called Hope. And it's by a British artist, Frederick Watts. And it perhaps is wrongly titled, if you think of it at the outset, because it's a picture of a blinded girl standing on a map or a globe of the world and trying to play a harp with broken strings. So you'd think the title would be Desolation, Not Hope, because here was a blindfolded girl unable to play the harp because the strings were broken and still trying to do it. But the title was rightly hope because the message was that Watts was trying to convey and why Mandela had it in his prison cell, even in the most hopeless of situations, there has to be hope. Even when it looks as if everything is hopeless and nothing can be done, if there is no hope, then people cannot progress. You know, a French philosopher said you can survive for 40 days without uh, water. You can survive for eight days without f food. You can survive for eight minutes, he said, without air. But you cannot survive for a second without hope. And that's the importance of you coming here together today. And that's the importance of the message that Coventry sends out out of the huge desolation of that night of 14th November 1940 came the desire and then the pressure and then the campaign and the, when the worldwide message that not only would there be forgiveness, but Coventry would show that there can be reconciliation and you can, despite conflict, war, devastation and death, you can build a more peaceful world and you can hope that we can journey and not in vain. And so, being here today is important in itself because you are sending that message out. We can hope for a better world. But hope has got to be more than wishful thinking. Hope's got to be more than a wing and a prayer. Hope's got to be more than simply uh, saying that something might happen or could happen or can happen. It's got to be a message that something must happen. The message we should send out is that we believe that we can will and must now build a more peaceful world. And if that message can go out from Coventry today, then you're in the great tradition of people in this great city who've always sent out the greatest possible message of reconciliation to the world. Thank you very much.